Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining today. Um, some of you might have seen me already yesterday. That was mostly in German. So today uh, it will be in English. And we are talking about English academic writing, five bad habits and how to fix them. But before we start in any way of, of talking about English academic writing, I would just like to just get a kind of small poll about why are you joining the seminar? Is it something that you, um, is it is it you starting your academic career and you don't have any idea of how to write or um, you're not quite sure about what is good writing, what is bad writing, uh, then say A, or is it something that you are uh, already doing and you want to improve, or is it something that, uh, that is B, or is it something that you um, are just generally interested about and would like to know more about, or maybe reaffirm some of your um, teachings and so on. So A, B, or C. Okay. A lot of C's. Okay, so it's more onto a general audience today than specific uh, goal or, or issue that you want to, to achieve here. Very good. Okay, just telling you a little bit about my background, my personal background. Um, I am a CELTA certified teacher. That means I have taught L uh, ESL, uh, English as a second language in China uh, for around uh, two and a half years. Uh, I have published multiple articles, have given presentations at work and workshops at international and regional conferences on the idea of teaching, on, um, on also how to create courses, how to write. Um, I also have been an editor and translator, not a certified translator, a translator normal translator and I have done course and curriculum cr creation also for academic writing in my time at, uh, in, at my time in China. So that is a little bit more a little bit about me and um, I would say let's start by asking you another question. What is the difference? What do you think is the difference between speech and writing? Is it the length? Is it the register? The type of feedback you get? What could be or what are the differences there? All okay. You can also write any other things that you that you have there. Vocabulary, okay, yeah, definitely. Especially register country degree of complexity uh, complexity style, yes more time to think in writing okay scientific vocabulary length spelling time of availability discourse okay okay thank you very much grandma yeah um most important what i think is that what you already said is you have more time that more time also means that you have no instant feedback so the writer needs to imagine the reader you need to think about who is going to read your text? Who is needing to understand what you're writing? And who is your audience, right? Which is a little bit more easier with, feed, uh, with direct feedback and speech, where you can see also nonverbal communication in order to understand what's going on. Also, writing is much younger in terms of how language or how we lose the language. So if you think about that, language is was the whole history of uh, language is combined in one day, then only 11 p.m. that was the rise of written language. So it is only an hour there already. So it's very, very young. Another question from me again. So why are so many academic texts obscure and difficult to read? Again, is this because of the terminology, the lack of examples, too many ideas in one paragraph, long arcane sentences? Is it maybe the people just want to be more scientific or what are your takes on that? Scientists think that way. High density of information, readers, writers, responsibility may the fact that the author is trying to appeal years at once, terminology, okay. Console. <laughs> that is a nice one. You can conceal your own confusion and obscurity. Right. 
Okay. <laughs> bad writing, yeah, bad writing has, has different uh, CS. Okay, basically what I would like to do today, as we say bad habits, we will look at, um, we want to look at three major things that you can do while writing and also about the idea of habit creation and how to think about your writing process. Those are the other two. So the, first of all, let's have a look at the best thing to do when you're writing or when you edit your writing is to use the active voice. That means verbs that drive along the, the sentence, trying to avoid the passive voice. This is something scientists like to do a lot of times. And um, so, however, this makes certain things much more unclear. So that the active, using the active voice is always understanding who is doing what. What is the cause and what is the effect of the scent of, of the people, what they're doing? Also, it is also a post responsibility. Think about mistakes have been made. That is a very nice standard sentence that you can read or that you can hear also a lot of times from maybe a government official. Mis mistakes have been made, not by me, not by you, not by them. Somebody made mistakes and yeah, now they are there. So you can also shift responsibility and don't take it yourself. And also it is about readability. The, usually if you use the passive voice, your sentence become much more longer and um, it is much less like we communicate. If you think about it, we usually say Sarah throws the ball, not the, throw, the, the ball is thrown by Sarah, right? So this basic understanding of subject, verb, object, using the active voice is something that helps your writing to become clearer. Um, you show who is responsible for the action that has been done and is better readable. I have given, I have prepared two example sentence using the passive voice. So it was concluded that the data had been falsified. And the second one, Furthermore, the reincarceration rate of African Americans has increased disproportionately to other groups since the legislation to distress the system in the US to be privatized was passed. <sighs> That's a long sentence. So maybe take a moment, just read that sentence for yourself and think about what could we do thinking about that we change from the passive into the active voice. So the first sentence could be something like this. The editors conclude that the authors falsified the data. So it is most important to know who concluded that. Yeah, the editors do. So they barred us more or less to, um, from, from false information and data in the area of uh, uh, fake news and everything that is most important, that authors should not falsify their data. And if the authors did so, they have to be called out on that. And the second one is, also, again, we have no responsibility of who is passing legislation. Who is doing that? That is usually the state governments in the, U in the US, and they allowed that, that to happen, maybe by intent, maybe uh, unintentionally. And this is the, the actually effect of that is the disproportionate um, increase of the reincarceration rate. So it's much more clear of what is happening here. Then we come to the next one that is called zombie nouns. This is um, with regards to Helen Sword, who has also made a very nice um, TED Ed video on YouTube. If you haven't watched it yet, um, please do. I will also put that in the sources at the end of the um, of the presentation. And what is a what is a zombie noun? A zombie noun usually is something that is an abstraction of an already existing verb. is uh, an abstraction of us already used verb or a noun and it's added a suffix. So for example, the globe, to globalize, globalization, okay? That is, that is her biggest um, uh, example there. And those are some of the endings that you can use. A zombie noun, usually you try to reduce the readability and make it more obscure for the reader to understand what the actual intent of the writer is, of the, of the message is. I have brought you another sentence here, and that is the occasional zombie noun will not sync your writing. 
What will, however, is a reliance on normalizations okay. that prevent good writing through abstraction okay. and that are an indication of an insufficiency of time spent editing. So what could you do about this? This is the occasional zombie noun will not sync your writing. Okay, yeah, you can use them. Sometimes they need to be used because they are specific terminology. However, but if you rely, right, the reliance, but if you rely mostly on normalization, it indicates that you have spent insufficient time to edit your manuscript. This is a much more clearer understanding of what the, what the sentence means. Also, what a lot of times happens with normalization, so with zombie nouns, is that you stretch this active sentence that we talked about before, subject, verb, object, where you have the main meaning carrying verb usually quite detached, um, um, detached from the subject that is doing the action. So, so we should put who said something and not use the passive. The passive can be used, uh, but sparingly. For example, if you talk about like in a methodology uh, part of your paper or so, then it's something where it's not important who did uh, actually do the act, did actually do the action, but it is mostly important of understanding what was done. So there are instances where you can use and you should use the passive voice rather than the active voice, but most of the time try to use the active voice. Okay, then we have the last one that I wanted to talk about was um, the structure of paragraphs and your essays in general. They should be the paragraphs, specifically the paragraphs, they are about on one idea, right? They are about carrying one idea and they should be short. They should be focusing on one idea only. So you shouldn't try to cram too many things in there as you have already stated up there in the comments um, above. And you should always go with the general to the detail. So your arguments first and supporting, de um, argument, uh, supporting details later. Also go from the light first and then the heavy. For example, you don't talk about um, storm, hurricane, heavy rain. You would not say that, right? <clears throat> you would talk about first um, the, you would first talk about heavy rain, storm, and hurricane. So it builds up from light to heavy. Also, what you might have also noticed there is a kind of parallelism, right? I would not say it rained heavily, then um, the storm, and then the hurricane, right? I would use the directly. Um, I would try to use a parallel structure of my arguments and what I'm doing. Fewer signposting. There are a lot of signpost words that usually is something that, for example, when you do your first um, start as if English is your second language, if you start off and you prepare for a TOEFL test or something like this, you are set to use those signpost words, right? To show directly what is your argument, what is the structure of your argument. However, if you have a good structure of your argument itself, um, a little bit, yes. If you have a good um, structure of your argument, then you would not need them. The biggest ones that you need are but and end, right? So either you're connecting certain ideas together or you're changing and saying, I have said this, but the other person has said this. And so this is, um, this is helping the reader along. Heavy signposting usually leads to confusion or shows that you are confused yourself about your ideas. So a paragraph should flow and should have maybe maximum one or two signposts. Maybe one is best. So in your structure also be always logical. We have looked at cause and effect, not as first effect and then the cause. Cause and effect. Time first and then the second and so on. What happened after each other? Also specifically when you talking about the chronology of certain things. For example, uh, you're talking about something that happened in the 17th century and you will not then go back uh, and then you go to the 20th century and then go back to the 13th century. Try to stay by chrono uh, in the chronological order. And as I said already, use a parallel sentence structure. So 
A is um, this and this is good because it helps to reduce uh, blood loss. B is good because it helps to reduce um, it reduces um, a certain function. And then you can switch that together. So both of them are helpful in order to get my argument across. This is the parallel sentence structure. Um, as, a, um, as we have a little bit more difficulties with the time, there is a possibility later um, to maybe talk about this a little bit more in detail in our um, after session. So let's go to the next one. Now I would like to think about more about this idea. Is writing a talent or a skill? What do you think? Is it a skill? Is it something that you can learn, that you can improve? Or is it a talent, something that you have that other people don't and just some people have? Like the Hemingway just had it. Both, okay. A mixture of both, but mostly skill. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Then. Um, I would say it's a skill. Writing is definitely a skill. So it is important that you create a habit of writing. And that is by using, um, using a journal and just start writing. The most important thing that I try to get my students across whenever I start a class is first of all, first five minutes, we would just write. We just would take out a piece of paper and they would just write for five minutes straight without thinking about what they're writing, just whatever comes to their mind and having the pen on paper. And by creating this habit, you get better and better and better. So you need to start creating a habit of writing and then you should not stop and wait for the muse to kiss you as in the Greek philosophy that you that you wait for some kind of uh, supernatural being to inspire you or anything. Writing is something that comes through practice and through doing it. So second is to be able to cut. You need to be able to use a red pen or if you don't like red, green, blue or whatever, and remove as much unnecessary words as possible to really get to that idea that you want to have. Um, a very good example there is uh, if you go to the, the course that I will talk about um, writing in science, there is a big, big chunk on just how to cut clutter in meaning like how to cut unnecessary words in your writing. And there is something called a writing mode versus an editing mode or a writing mode versus editing uh, editor mode. And you should not be writing and editing at the same time, but you should take them apart and make them distinct from each other. So this is what I'm talking about now, which is the writing mode. In the writing mode, you continue writing without actually um, rechecking what you have wrote. You finish your paragraph or idea um, as a draft before you revise it. So this is something what you usually do when you're sitting on the computer, you're writing a sentence and you say, uh, once upon a time, there was a castle. And you say, no, it wasn't a castle. It was a palace. Okay. And you go back with the backslash and you try in palace and then you have lost what you actually wanted to write. This is very, very bad. Writing mode, just try to continue writing, write out this paragraph that you had in your mind without ever checking or anything. And also without going backlash and saying, oh, I, I misspelled uh, that because I pressed the I instead of the D or something like this. The best is always to cover your display if you're writing on a computer or to hide the lines that you have already written with a piece of paper when you're writing on a, on a sheet of paper. And then you go into editing mode once you have done that. And the editing mode is then when you go, first of all, to reread your sentence and your paragraph. So check whether there is something that you have to say in that paragraph. Is there an idea? Is the, is the idea clear? If that didn't happen at all yet, then you first need to understand or think about what is the idea? What is what is what is my argument? What is what did I want to come uh, bring across? After that, you can go into fixing your spelling and your grammar, and um, then you can go and reread. Do this: what I said, cut, cut, cut unnecessary words and phrases, and also then restructure your argument. And then you need to repeat that over and over and over again. This is what poets, novelists, and so on do. Yes, they do that all the time. And they let also a lot of other people do that for them. So writing is also not something that you do solely and you have 
have this talent and you just are able to um, recheck and revise your own paragraphs no there are editors for this try to ask somebody else who is not from your profession or not in your academic field to read what you have written what you think is understandable and uh, let them tell you no i don't understand at all what you're talking about so give other people a chance to help you make uh, what you know understandable so I have some uh, good sources, I think, that uh, could help you with your um, yeah, endeavor to write better, to get along. And that it would be a very good book by Steven Pinker, a, one, uh, a linguist and cognitive scientist who has written a lot about language and specifically also on the sense of style, where it is a, a very good um, understanding of how to use grammar, what grammar actually means. So it's not like this, what we maybe have heard in, in school directly, but how actually those different things combine sense and give um, and uh, deliver meaning. Then, as I said, this very short video, Beware of Normalizations, aka uh, Zombie Nouns by Helen Sword on YouTube. And if you want to get a kind of starting point where you um, mix this with, I just want to get some ideas and some, some techniques, then Writing in Science by uh, Kristen Sainani um, on Coursera is also a good way to go to. In general, if you want to improve your writing in any case, whatever you do, read, 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 read good writing, read good novels and so on. It doesn't need to be academic. And then try to analyze why do you enjoy this reading, reading this essay, this paper, this book? Why is it? Tr try to actively read it rather than just trying to understand what it's saying. Try to also understand what, how it's saying it. Also, think about using a thesaurus and a dictionary. Please do not only use a thesaurus because what happened a lot of times, specifically in academic writing, when you're writing from um, in a, in, as, as a foreigner, so not as a native speaker or somebody in the field that is new in the field, you want to be uh, to express yourself more and more and you want to use different words and different terms. Do not do that. If you have a certain academic field and you have a term for a certain thing, use that term because every time you exchange it for a different term for a, son a synonym that could bring with it a whole bunch of other understanding nuances and so on that shouldn't be there it is not problematic if you repeat this term over and over again you will not you will not change nra and dna by itself because you say, oh, it's more or less the same. No, it's not. It's something completely different, right? But here it's a very good example of the stark dichotomy between those two things. And a dictionary, when you use terms, try to understand what they actually mean, because not everything that is a synonym has also the same meaning. There is, as we said, also a different register of when you should use <clears throat> certain terms. So some languages, some verbs are not, um, should not be used when you um, writing academic. Well, when you're writing something casually, you can do that. So use a dictionary to get also a little bit of understanding. What does this word actually mean? And also get yourself a comprehensive guide on grammar. As I said, Stephen Pinker has a little bit on grammar, but not in, in the way of how we do that. Um, also in order to argue with other people because they say, you shouldn't say that, or the comma doesn't go there. And you say, no, it goes there because I intended it to be like that. So you also need to be able to argue against somebody else um, saying that what you're doing is wrong. And the more you understand about grammar, the better you get. Um, could I recommend a good grammar book? <laughs> Unfortunately, on top, of, uh, on top of my head, I don't have a grammar book right now. <laughs> but I think... Um, if you go to uh, Cambridge or Oxford, you, you would definitely get also a good grammar book there. So as you have the Oxford or Cambridge Dictionary, you also have their grammar guides that definitely could help you there for um, specifically UK um, uh, for, for British English. Okay, um, we're nearing the end of this. We have only five minutes left. So um, 
oh, there's a little bit of German in there. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, I just want to introduce very shortly also the academy that I'm working with, and uh, that is the Arts Martini Academy. You can see the um, thing over here, and um, they have in very individualized courses, very theme and context based, and it's very time adjusted. So it's there to the uh, to the learner. It's both basically or mostly um, geared towards students, working professionals, and uh, specific fields like um, technicals, uh, technical translations and so on. And also you can do their technical translations and prose translations. So actually also novels and so on can be translated in that academy. And um, due to the fact um, that it is the Expo Lingua today, um, there is a small short offer um, that you can book the course in order to get um, a course of six people maximum with two times a week for two months on the idea of writing that I will be giving on starting off with basic um, understanding of writing um, habits and so on and then later getting into the idea of speech writing and then going back to this uh, bigger thing of essay writing. So that is from my side for now. Um, we have still four minutes until we need to get to the next after meeting. Um, and the link will be sent in the chat in a moment, or you can also see it on the website on the uh, presentation there. Uh, do you have any more questions by now? For now, so before we go then into the after meeting. Thank you very much. I thank you that you enjoyed it. <clears throat> uh, I'll just uh, post the link for the yeah for the uh, meeting. Just a moment. The recordings are available on the website, um, just because a couple of people have asked that. They're available at once the whole event is over. And um, they're exactly in the same place that you found the link to the Zoom place, which is in the program. Okay. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? I mean, that's that's what we're here for. So, um, mm -hmm. I mean, it was it was it was a lot, um, and I think there is definitely something that needs to think in for a moment. And you need to have maybe also more examples. Uh, it's mm -hmm. difficult on the top of my head to get so many together, but there are good good courses and good uh, things to to do to to pull from. So, best is always to use specific things. Practice makes perfect. Yes, <laughs> thank you, yeah. Helen. If I could ask one question, actually, because yeah. um, most of the things you wrote, I, I mean, immediately understood like, ah, oh, that's totally useful. Um, one thing that I thought was more interesting, but thought maybe another example would be help helpful. The, this um, thing you referred to about repeating a sentence structure, um, this leads to this. Um, also, this other thing leads to another thing. I kind of intuitively got that, but I um, wondered if there was more to that than I... There is, there is more to that. Um, if you go into the basic style guides, you would definitely have something called topic sentence. So that is usually the main argument of your, uh, of your paragraph, right? And um, then you would um, go in the parallel sentence structure or parallel sentence uh, setting up of the paragraph. You could then go um, <clears throat> first of thinking about all the things that agree with that argument and then all the things that disagree with that argument. So um, that is that is that is the idea. You mean parallelism doesn't mean only sentence structure, but in general, trying to get the reader the same A B C and then A B C. You know that you did. Did you get that? Um, unfortunately, I do not have um, a different. Um, I don't. I don't have a different example right now um, here on my computer that I can show directly. Okay, um, I think we're nearing the end, then I would say um, leave it for now and we we'll see each other in the um, after meeting room.
See you there. Bye-bye.